powerful text this morning, maybe a text that some preachers would just skip over and head of, over to something that's happy, clappy, and goosebumpy. But we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna unpack this this morning, and it's powerful. And again, listen to these three verses. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Last week, we covered uh, verses 20 through 23, and we found this encouragement to sexual purity, and God is very, uh, very vividly here telling us to avoid certain kinds of behavior because they're destructive to our souls. Adultery is a, a sin that will destroy the marriage covenant that kills men and women that destroys families, and it's something that God doesn't want his children participating in because of the destruction it brings. Now, we cover the fact that it's a parent's job to teach children a moral foundation, that we would take our father's command and our mother's law, and we would bind them, you know, upon our necks, upon our hearts. Why? To keep them close to us, because we live in a world that contradicts everything that biblical morality teaches us. And the minute we walk out of here into the world, our morality is under assault, And there are many people telling us that the Bible has nothing to do with, you know, these modern contemporary times, and you can live like this, and you can practice that, and it's all good, and it's all going to produce happy, you know, lives, and 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 the truth is that we've seen that the destruction of divorce and the destruction of adultery in our society has produced nothing but hardship, amen? God loves us enough to warn us not to be sucked into these snares. We're to bind and to tie the things that our parents and our pastors and godly people around us taught us because they'll keep us. Now, verse 24 continues to reveal more of the benefits of biblical morality here and and showing us how it is that we uh, protect ourselves to maintain our sexual purity. So the commands and laws of God are taught to us by our godly people, by godly parents. If you had godly parents who gave you a good moral foundation, be thankful for for that. But it says here that it's going to keep us. And keep us from what? To keep us, verse 24 says, from the evil woman. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about this here a little. Uh, <laughs> to keep us from the evil woman. I said in first service, all the guys, when they hear evil woman, they're like, yeah, that, that's, that's right. <laughs> And all the ladies are like, what? (laughs) Now, why does it say that there? Now, I want to say a couple things about this. These principles, and I want to do my very best to apply them equally to both genders. But first, you got to realize two things about this passage. Number one, it's written in the literary form of a father speaking to his son. So the father is going to warn his son about the kind of ladies he should avoid. Now, that doesn't mean a father won't talk to his daughter about the kind of men to avoid. So these apply to both genders, but this is the literary form. Number two, uh, you know, this text is not even remotely suggesting that women are intrinsically evil and men are, you know, somehow inherently noble. Right? The ladies are laughing now. Because, and it's, the opposite is not true either, that women are inherently perfect and men are just, you know, half-converted knuckle-draggers. And if they would just, you know, we get a lot of that from feminism, don't we? Listen, both genders have issues. And, and each of us have to keep our sexual purity. So while this is spe- a father speaking to his son, this is in no way, uh, you know, downplaying any gender. This applies to all of us. So here a godly father is warning his child, and wasn't that the point of last week's message, that as parents it's our job to warn our children about the snares that are out there. We can't be silent. They'll get sucked up. They'll get chewed up. They'll get spit out by the world. We've got to teach them the principles of God that will keep them safe. So here's his father speaking to his child, and he wants to warn them that there are people out there that will play the role of the sexual predator. That's just what's being described here in verse 24. To keep from the evil woman, a sexual predator, from the flattering tongue of a seductress. A powerful moment in Scripture here where God is warning all of us that there are those out there who are predatory and seek to derail our moral purity. 
Now, understand a few things here that our world celebrates things that the Bible calls sin. And we as the church have to stand up for righteousness without being contentious and doing it in love, but we need to be able to call sin, sin. And even when I say the word sin, it's like we all kind of shrink back because we all know we deal with it. None of us like to admit it, but we don't want to talk about it. But the truth is that there is sin in the world and there is evil in the world. And that's another thing that our world's uncomfortable with. Oh, don't call anything evil. It's a, it's a lifestyle choice. It's an alternative. It's a, it's a different path. There are some things that God just plain flat out sees as evil. We covered seven things that he hates. Why? Because they're evil. And the one who functions in a way that they are predatory upon other people and, and, and they want to suck them into lifestyles that will destroy them spiritually. Listen to me. They're not good people. They're not innocent people. They're not noble. What they're doing, God's word calls evil. Now, I'm not going to let up, so hang in there. Hold on to your, you know, put your trays in the upright position and fasten your seatbelts. But I want to preach the truth and love you this morning. Those who willingly involve themselves in prostitution, who charge money for sex, they are doing evil in the sight of God. Those who willingly engage in sex trafficking, human trafficking, people who are pimps and madams, they are doing evil in the sight of God. The, the, those who willingly work in the porn industry for pleasure, for fame, for money, they are doing evil in the sight of God. Those who seduce others that they know are married with no regard for their spouses or children to put them as a little notch on their belt are doing evil in the sight of God. Listen to me. Those who exploit and abuse and sexualize children and take unconsenting children and make them do things that they would never do, that is evil in the sight of God. When I started this message series, I mentioned that, you know, in New York State now, the next thing on the docket, we've, we've legalized abortion to the point where it's wide open. We've legalized drug use now where it's wide open. The next thing on the docket is uh, they want to legalize prostitution. And there's bills floating around out there. On a national level, there are thrusts on a national level to pass bills and laws that would decriminalize pedophilia where pedophiles are rebranding themselves. Not, don't call them pedophiles anymore. They're maps. They're minor attracted persons. And listen, it's out there on the internet when all you're scrolling. Take a look out there and understand what Pastor Rick is saying is, is out there. And they're trying to normalize and decriminalize even pedophilia at this point. It's such a slippery slope when we give in to sexual uh, debauchery in one area, it, it slides into the next thing. Well, if that, then why not this? If this, why not that? If that? And where does it stop? When we throw out the word of God and we throw out the creator's intent for the sexual relationship, where does it stop? <laughs> now, I know this is happy, clappy, and it fills seats, and probably attendance will jump next week. And we're, some of us are crying already. But the truth is, we've got to hear God's heart on this because this destroys people. It destroys marriages and families. And God doesn't want that for us. If you were paying attention to that last list of examples I used, you'll notice I said willingly, willingly, willingly over and over again. And there's a reason I said that. I did it on purpose, and it's very important, because there are those who are caught up in these lifestyles, in the porn industry, and, and all these things, and they were trafficked into them. They were exploited into them by their addiction. They, they were violently forced into these lifestyles by others. Listen, and that's the real evil there. And hell awaits those that exploit our children and exploit women and exploit others for these things. Listen, there needs to be a repentance nationally that we would stop, you know, celebrating them. It's almost like they're, some of these people have become celebrities, madams and pimps and people who used to be drug dealers, and now they're celebrities. What have we put on the pedestal? And what does that say to our children? We need national repentance. We need repentance in our culture. 
But if we won't, hell awaits, judgment awaits, because these things that are willingly done that contradict God's morality are evil in the sight of God. So notice the main weapon here of the sexual predator. You're going to find it where it says here, to keep from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue, say flattering, Flattering. from the flattering tongue of the seductress. The main weapon of the sexual predator is their tongue. It's their words. These people seduce and exploit others, getting them to do things they never wanted to do with their smooth speech, and they deceive them through flattery. How many have ever been flattered before? It's flattering, isn't it? It's hard to resist flattery, amen? Even when you know someone's playing you, when they're just trying to manipulate you and they're telling you stuff and you're like, a little bit more. Tell tell me about my eyes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I did lose weight. Thanks for noticing. Flattery's hard to resist. You know, even there's been people that have been flattering me and I knew where they were going. They were trying to manipulate me and I was just like, you know, all right, kiss me now, Judas. Let's get this over with. But, and, and the flattery was almost hard to resist. But flattery is a very potent, powerful weapon that people use. And it is the main weapon uh, of the sexual predator that they're going to use flattery in such a way that it would manipulate a person. And I want you to know some things about flattery. Flattery is the art of telling a person exactly what they think of themselves. You got it, Charles. All right, let me try the other side a little slow. Let's try over here. Flattery is the art of telling someone exactly what they think of themselves. Yeah, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, I am pretty great. Yeah, thanks for noticing, you know. And, and it's like this person is like tapping into what, what, what they feel about your insecurity or but what, what they think you want to hear or what will blow up your ego. So you tell them what they want to hear, and that's flattery. Flattery is like perfume. It's okay to smell it. Just don't drink it, right? It's okay to compliment here and there. Mark Twain said I could go a whole year on one good compliment. Amen. Anybody like to be, have a compliment? Sincere compliment, right? Now, if you're not raising your hand, I pray you get no compliments. Yeah, I like a compliment, right? It's okay to smell it a little bit, especially if the person's sincere. But don't drink it. It's intoxicating. People who need their ego stroked and need to be told what they want to hear all the time. Flattery is a dangerous thing. Unfortunately, many people, uh, given the choice, would rather be hurt by flattery than to be helped by criticism. See, and that's a character issue there. Never let the flatterer manipulate you. And that's what a flatterer is trying to do, manipulate you. Now, smooth speech, when used by a person who has perverse motives, is a dangerous thing. The sexual predator who's trying to wear someone down to get them to relinquish their moral stance will say things like this, oh, you are so handsome. What a handsome man. You clean up so nice. (laughs) You're so strong. You're funny. Yeah, I know. You're intelligent. You have a beautiful mind. Oh, what a load that is. <laughs> How about the flatterer will say things like this. You're not appreciated like you should be. You should be celebrated. Come on. You should be attended to the way you deserve. If you were mine, I would serve you. If you were mine, I would spoil you. I would worship you. Do you know there's people who want to be worshipped? We got this whole diva thing. I'm a diva. I'm a goddess. Worship me. My wife and I take turns throwing up when we hear that stuff. We love each other. We don't worship each other. We worship God. Only God deserves to be worshiped. If you were mine, I would worship you. (laughs) These are the words of the flatterer, and they are intoxicated, and they deceive Many. We have to be careful of the words that are used. Look at the text, the evil woman with the flattering tongue of a seductress. Use wisdom. Be aware. Understand. Now, listen to me. If you're insecure or you have low self-esteem or you don't know your self-worth, 
and you have unmet needs, or maybe you have an unattentive or abusive spouse, if you are not actively getting godly counsel to help those areas, you are making yourself very vulnerable to the flattering tongue of the seductress. You and I have to deal with our insecurities. Now it's quiet. Move on, Pastor. How about our self-esteem, our self-worth? Our worth needs to come with, from who we are in Christ. Not be how we look or the position we have or if we turn heads or not. Our worth needs to come from who we are in Jesus. If, if you have unmet needs, if you have an unattentive or an abusive spouse, you need to get counseling. Why? Because those things will create a vacuum in you. And, and listen, the seductress will smell that and they'll attack you with the smooth speech and they'll deceive you. That person that just wants to listen to you at work. That person who notices you and flirts with you. Ah, the rubber just hit the road. It's dead quiet. This stuff is dangerous. And it leads to adultery. And it destroys families, and God hates it. Deal with your issues. Deal with your insecurity. Deal with your marriage if it has issues. Because the enemy will smell that vulnerability and exploit it. Verse 25, look what it says. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her, you, uh, let her allure you with her eyelids. Look at that beauty. We're going to talk about that. And then the eyelids, they're just batting those eyes. I can't even do it. But you know, you know what, you know what the, the text is saying there. Look, you know, do not lust after her beauty. Now, verse 25 is telling us the best way to avoid the seducer is to first avoid being captivated by their physical beauty. Once you let yourself be enamored with someone's beauty and charms, and listen, many times it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a spiritual thing. It's a trick. It's a trap. And, and they're really not interested in you. They're interested in conquering you, in robbing you of your purity. There's spiritual forces behind these things. Do not lust after her beauty. Listen, we, we have made beauty an idol since the beginning of time. Man was always, you know, lusting after those people who were beautiful. You, you think back in the Old Testament when Abraham, his wife was so beautiful, he used to tell everybody, tell, tell them you're my sister. Why? Because he, he said, if, if they know you're my wife, they're, they're going to kill me and take you. People lusted over beauty. Beauty has been made an icon. It's been made an idol that that the world demands that we worship. And it should never be like that. Stunning, attractive, beautiful people. uh, You know, they're part of our culture. Our culture fawns over them to the point of worshiping them. It's the beautiful people that dominate our secular society in the movies, in music, in fashion, sports, politics, and in the media. It's the beautiful people everybody wants to see. Those people going down the red carpet. Who's going down the gray carpet? Anybody going down the... The B-list. The not so beautiful. But beauty can be an idol. And it's an idol that, you know, the world wants us to worship. And once we are enamored by beauty, once we lust after someone's beauty, then we become very susceptible to the smooth speech of the deceptive, flattering words. The saying that beauty is only skin deep is absolutely true. Sometimes it takes us some age to figure that out. But you know what? We've all met people who are beautiful on the outside and ugly on the inside. And th- those are the most confusing people. You're like, I want to like you, but you're rotten. I want to be near you, but now I want to be far away from you. Beauty is only skin deep, and that's so true. Why? Because real beauty isn't shallow. It's not superficial. It doesn't come out of a makeup bottle. It doesn't come from a hairstylist. It comes from a kind heart, from a humble spirit, and a pure soul. That's where real beauty comes from. It's more than skin deep. Now, is that the obligatory clap? Yeah, you're right. But do we really believe that? You know... Not only is beauty more than skin deep, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
There are some people that can find beauty in anything. Do you know God can find beauty in anything and in everyone? We might look in the mirror and go, man. You ever look in the mirror and go, I want to talk to the manager. God looks at us and he's like, you're beautiful. You're my beautiful daughter. You're my beautiful son. Does a parent look at their baby and go, that's an ugly baby. No, every parent, oh, it's so beautiful. You ever see him, oh, my baby's so beautiful. (laughs) Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Now, J. Stowell Moody, who is a missionary, tells this story from the mission field that proves that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. He said, when I was in West Africa in Timbuktu, did you know that was a real place? (laughs) I learn something every week. When I was in West Africa in Timbuktu, the missionaries informed me that in that culture, the larger the women were, the more beautiful they were thought to be. In fact, a young missionary who had a small, skinny wife was pulled aside by the nationals and said, your wife doesn't reflect well on you. You obviously can't provide enough for her. Think about this. This is true stuff. A popular proverb in that part of the world says, if your wife is on a camel and the camel cannot stand up, you have a beautiful wife. (laughs) Now listen, to each his own, because beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Now, I never pray for a wife that could flatten a camel. And ladies, you might be praying for a John Cena or, or a John Candy. I don't know, but... Whatever way, it's good because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We should never, amen. Listen, we should never let the world or Hollywood or anyone hold up an idol and say, this is beauty, you worship that. We can see beauty everywhere. (laughs) It's more than skin deep. It's in the eye of the beholder. Mm. So we've got to break loose of that you know, lusting after uh, beauty of, or of the allure of her eyelids, of being, you know, captivated by someone's charm or flirtatiousness. You know, we all know those people who are flirtatious. We deal with them, you know, in, in, in society, at work, uh, wherever, you know, and we should be able to spot that and avoid that person. That's not a right heart that someone's out there trolling to see who will bite what I'm preaching now. Real beauty is more than skin deep. Real beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Now it takes real spiritual sensitivity and maturity to discern and avoid uh, the influence of such a, a person. Don't lust after her beauty, nor the, uh, let her allure you. And I want you to Tuck this deep in your heart and begin to cultivate that spiritual sensitivity that spots the person who has sketchy motives and hears the smooth speech of the flatterer and then categorically avoids such a person. No matter how much your flesh might like it, avoid that person. Verse 26 is where we bring this in for landing. It says, For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Now, remember, this applies to both genders. But there, let's look at two things that the adulterous predator does to its victim. Number one, they diminish the victim's God-given potential. Do you know what the enemy hates about humanity more than anything else? That we have the potential to walk with God, to be saved, and to spend eternity with him. When... When the enemy of our souls see a baby's born, the the devil hates the unlimited purity and potential of that child. That's why there's such a war on children in the womb, that they would be aborted before they could reach their potential. And the devil hates the potential of mankind. So the adulterous predator hates that potential. Why? Because there's a spiritual force behind them that wants to snuff out that potential. So what do they seek to do? To diminish that person's God-given potential. Look what it says. For by means of a harlot, a sexual predator, a man is reduced. Reduced. Did you hear that? That's diminished to what? A crust of bread. Does that sound appetizing? How many after church today are going out for a crust of bread? Yeah, at the Daily Planet, do you have crust of bread? 
No, man, you cut the crust off, it dries up. Nobody wants that. You know, you ever seen crust? You cut it off the kid's sandwich, and then like an hour later, it's like a non-food item. That's, what, that's why when we open a loaf of bread, what do you do? You reach past the butt, and the next slice ain't no good either. And the next one, th that's the slice I want, right? Then at the end of the loaf, it's all butts and... That's what dad gets to eat. Puts it in the toaster. No one likes me around here. But we want the fresh bread. We want the, we, we want the good piece. We don't want the crust. The crust, the, the, that dried up thing, it's suggesting something there. When, when the text says he's reduced what he's diminished to, a crust of bread, that's something that's depleted. It's unappealing. It's dried up and it just should be thrown out. You see, when the adulterous predator gets you to compromise your values and to sacrifice your purity, they diminish that God-given potential you had, and they, they dry up all the blessing in you, and they, they take something from you that can't be gotten back. Diminished, reduced to something that's unappealing, ready to be thrown out. That's what the enemy wants to do with us. But we have to avoid, we have to avoid these situations because they are destructive to us and they will destroy our potential. And don't kid yourself and think, no, it'll be fine, I'll get away with it, nobody will know. It never works that way. The man or the woman who succumbs to adultery diminishes and reduces themselves to something much less than God intended them to be. They destroy their marital relationship. They destroy their marriage covenant. They, listen, they ruin their own testimony and destroy their integrity, forfeiting the respect of friends and family and even their own children. Do you see the end game here? It's ugly. And sin might seem fun on the onset, but it's not fun in the end. It'll always cost us more than we wanted to pay, take us further than we wanted to go, and steal things from us we can never get back. The second thing the adulterous predator does to their victim, one, they diminish their potential. Two, they kill the things that are most precious to them. Look what the text says here. An adulteress will pray, say pray, pray. upon his precious life. Realize the sexual predator is not validating your self-worth. They're not validating your desirability. Well, it's about time someone noticed how wonderful I am. That's not what they're doing. What they're really doing is preying on you. They're preying on you like a wolf would prey on a newborn fawn, ready to just tear it to pieces. You're, be, you're being set up for the kill. You're becoming the prey. You're not being validated. You're not being, you know, oh, somebody finally noticed me. Somebody loves me. Somebody thinks I'm special. God noticed you. God loves you. God knows you're special. You're becoming prey for the wolves. Don't put yourself in that position. Realize what we just mentioned here they are taking something precious from their victims. And the precious things of life are the things that we're losing. Uh, when, uh, when our testimony is tarnished and shattered and we're destroyed and, and friends and family know what we did and our marriage is dissolved and our kids don't have the same respect for us. God help us to not be so foolish to think these things are victimless crimes. There's no repercussions. There always is. When we allow ourselves to be prey, we'll be preyed upon, and it will cost us what is precious. I pray that as we have unpacked these three verses, that the Holy Spirit has opened up all of our eyes and put something in each of our hearts to be able to realize there are people out there who are predatory and who want to prey on us. And whether we're single or married, young or old, we're all susceptible to it. So we have to guard our hearts. We have to understand that flattery and lusting after beauty and, and being taken in by the charms of others is a dangerous game to play. And if you're here this morning and you're, you're being attacked by these things and maybe you're on the threshold, listen, pump the brakes, stop, get away, run to God, get help, get counsel. It's not too late. 
And if you've crossed the line in these areas, repent and find restoration and begin to walk right in the, in the sight of God once again. He will forgive and he will restore. And that's good news today. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I pray this morning that this word sobers us up. Father, your, your, your word provides encouragement to us, peace for us, warnings to us. And Lord, I pray that as uh, we've been warned this morning, Lord God, that we would take a good look at our lives, where we are, have susceptibility, Lord, where we have uh, problems with our, our view of ourself or our self-confidence or Maybe we have a marriage that's unfulfilling and a spouse that's unattentive. Father, help us to get help with these areas. Father, I pray that none of us would allow ourselves to be prey, but that, Lord God, we would find strength in keeping your word and living a pure life and enjoying the benefits of righteousness. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give him praise this morning.